so welcome all of you to this session on urban heat causes and solutions. And um, before before we go to the first presentation, I would like to quickly introduce our panelists and. So what we have today on the stage is um, Mr. Chu Wentung, next to me. And then we have Professor Yuan Chao um, on the far right to my side. And then we have also connected from Canada, from Montreal, Professor Jan Carmelier. So let me introduce first Mr. Chu Wentung. He's the Group Director, Research and Development of the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore. He leads his team to research for solutions to meet Singapore's future planning needs and steers URA's research programs. Then Professor Yuan Chao, he's an assistant professor at the Department of Architecture at, of, and of the National University of Singapore. He's the founder and principal investigator of NUS Urban Climate Design Lab. He's also a principal investigator in the Future Resilient Systems Program hosted by the Singapore ETH Center. And his research interests include climate sensitive urban planning and design for sustainable resilient cities. And then our third speaker, Professor Jan Carmelier, he's a full professor and chair of building physics at the Department of Mechanical and Process Engineering at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He's also a principal investigator in the Future Resilient Systems Program. His research interests concern, among others, urban climate and urban heat island mitigation and multi-energy decentralized systems at building and urban scale. Now, without any further ado, I would like to hand over the mic and the control of the slides to, Prof to Mr. Chu Wentung. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jonas, for your introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Wen Tong from uh, the Urban Redevelopment Authority. Um, for the people who are not familiar, uh, the uh, URA uh, is actually the master planner for Singapore. So I'll be sharing a little bit about the uh, urban heat risk in Singapore and the efforts that the government is uh, undertaking to mitigate this risk. Then first I'll just, uh, I think I'll go through some of this, uh, the heat island risk and how Singapore is uh, dealing with this and what are the steps we are going to to take going forward. Okay. So um, if you look at our uh, historical data, uh, our temperatures have been ranging from about uh, 24 to 32 degrees Celsius uh, historically, and it has gone up roughly about a quarter of a degree per decade in the roughly in the past 50, 60 years. Um, this is projected to go up uh, by a further 1.4 to 4.6 degrees by the end of the century uh, due to climate change. And uh, based on our uh, research by our Center for Climate Research Singapore, uh, we, we may get days of peak temperature hitting 40 degrees as early as 2045. So on top of this, um, we also have what we call the urban heat island effect where the temperatures of built up areas are higher than the temperatures uh, that are in the rural or undeveloped areas. So, uh, based on some of our earlier studies, we see that the temperatures um, for uh, can be up to two degrees higher in the day and four degree, uh, two to four degrees higher at night. So basically, uh, you you add on our baseline temperatures. Originally, I mentioned twenty four to thirty two degrees. You add on the the increase in temperature due to climate change, and then you add on the effects of uh, urban heat island effect for the urban areas. When, and you can see that Singapore is highly urbanized. Uh, most of our city is, has been developed. And you add it cumulatively, uh, climate change has, will lead to higher temperatures, urban areas will be even hotter. So that may make Singapore very hot. Uh. Okay, that brings us to the next point. Okay, how do we mitigate some of this uh, urban heat, lah, given that uh, we have the dual effects of climate change as well as the urban heat island effect. Okay, so some of our, our measures that we're taking, uh, you can see in this chart, it's a little bit small to read, 
but you have a mix of uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, action. Uh, and some of the action that we do will also contribute for both sides. Lah. So the good news is some of the, our initiatives will have both uh, uh, at, uh, mitigation benefits as well as uh, adaptation benefits. I will talk a little bit about some of these uh, initiatives in the following slides. So um, I, m most of our uh, slides are also covered under the Singapore Green Plan that we announced earlier this year, uh, Singapore Green Plan 2030. And I will cover the parts that are talking about the, under the resilient future, keeping Singapore cool. So um, some of the plans whereby urban planning gives us a, a upstream intervening possibilities. La. So it allows us to lay the foundation for the city and uh, allow us to capture some of the sustainable benefits. So one of the, the, one of the key initiatives is planning for greenery. So greenery itself um, has a, 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 a heat mitigation impacts. Okay? So it provides shade, it provides transpiration and lowers the temperature. But uh, beyond uh, the, the benefits for, for urban heat, actually it also has other benefits uh, such as the, you know, um, restoring nature, providing uh, recreation spaces, and, and et cetera, et cetera. The, the other um, concept that we talked, uh, the other planning intervention is looking at the planning for mobility. So in terms of planning for mobility, we, I, I, I I'll argue that we look at it at three levels. So one is, how do we reduce mobility demand? So by planning amenities and jobs closer to homes, we reduce the need to travel. And even if you do need to travel, you travel for a shorter distance. So this, this has obviously a mitigation benefit by reducing the, the trips that we make and the length of trips we make and hence the embedded carbon in those trips. At the same time, this also provides a lot more convenience and time savings for the residents. At the next level, uh, we encourage uh, people to use public transport. So public transport, whether it's by trains or by, uh, by buses or active mobility, also provides a, a means of transportation that has more scale and hence a lower carbon footprint. At the same time, it also has benefits of having a lower land footprint and lower labor requirements. And then finally, if you, uh, 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 on top of that, we are also trying to encourage the switch of modes to uh, more greener vehicles. So uh, we've announced that uh, by 2040, all our vehicles will, will be of a greener nature and uh, you, you won't be able to register uh, internal combustion engine car by 2030. So, so the vehicle itself will be green. Um, and this uh, move to electric vehicles, for example, will also have other environmental benefits. It lowers the air pollution, uh, the noise pollution in the city. So as you can see, when we are doing planning, we, we don't just look at one uh, benefit, lah, which is the reduction of urban uh, heat island or to, uh, to reduce heat risk. We are planning for multiple objectives. So, so many of our measures have to, has to help us uh, accrue to multiple benefits. And that also makes it easier to sell some of these initiatives to the public. Beyond laying the foundation, uh, we can also sculpt our urban geometry to, to be climate sensitive and to help us reduce the extent of the urban heat. So, so this, uh, this, I think, slide gives us a few examples of how we are trying to uh, increase uh, using our, the urban forms to increase our resilience to urban heat. So, for example, aligning the, the, the street and building elements so that the wind can flow through, uh, through the estate, uh, varying building heights, as well as having a low side coverage so that you trap less heat. And then also taking advantage of uh, building form and permeability so that uh, different parts of the buildings can encourage airflow and natural ventilation. Then finally, having positioned our city to be heat resilient, uh, we also want to address the upstream uh, heat source emissions. Yeah. So having a, a lot of buildings and hard surfaces in, the, in our built environment it uh, tends to trap heat. So one mitigation measure could be the use of things like cool materials or cool paints, which reflect the heat back to, to, to space. So hence, uh, it allows us to, to capture less heat and lowers the heat required, for example, to cool the building down. Then 
uh, we also look at other energy efficiency systems, so things like district cooling may make it more efficient for the cooling of our buildings and hence uh, reduce the, the heat load required to, to cool the buildings. Photovoltaic is, uh, itself has uh, multiple benefits. So other than um, uh, converting the uh, solar energy to, to electrical energy, it also re reduces the, the heat load of the buildings. At the same time, we are uh, doing some R&D to build a digital urban climate twin. Basically, this is a, a federated models or model. So we integrate different models like land use models, transport models, industry models, etc. Uh, into a climatic model at different scales, the meso scale and the micro scales. And that allows us to do uh, multiple analysis for urban heat islands uh, or for outdoor thermal comfort. This project is currently done uh, together with our uh, research partners from uh, ETH as well as uh, SMU and NUS. Then we can leverage this uh, digital urban climate twin to explore different what if scenarios that to help us in our planning. So where can we introduce new parks and open spaces to reduce the hotspots? Uh, what kind of wind corridors that we can explore looking at uh, to safeguard in Singapore at a much bigger scale? Uh, optimizing the different uh, areas for uh, building energy efficiency, as well as uh, planning for the, what we talked about earlier, the urban density and geometry to minimize the urban heat island effect. So beyond the, our current efforts, uh, we are also looking at uh, other technologies and ways to uh, going forward to help us address urban heat. So some of these things are, um, in the, for example, we talk about the digital urban climate twin, uh, which requires a lot of modeling work. Uh, we are also studying where we can uh, deploy sensors to help us calibrate the models, and at the same time also help us assess the efficiency of some of the, the mitigation measures we talked about, for example, like cool paints. Then we're also interested in research in other areas to help us advance uh, some of this. Uh, for example, we, talked to, uh, we have very limited roof space. So we have always a competition between solar panels, cool panes, and greenery on the roofscapes. Uh, so some of the R&D we're interested in is, for example, how can we integrate uh, these different solutions to maximize the value of the roof space? Like, for example, can we integrate certain greenery under the solar panels? So it lowers the temperature of the, the roof, which also increases the uh, efficiency of the solar panels because they operate better at lower temperatures. So we are uh, interested in some of these research areas and we welcome the, the academic community, the research community to work with us to continue to study some of these uh, areas. Okay, so with that, I think I, I hope I've given you guys a quick overview of what we are doing in Singapore uh, with regards to urban heat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chu, for your nice presentation. Now we go to the next. Uh, panelist, which is um, Professor Yuan. Over to you. Thank you, Yunus. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Yuan Zhao from NUS. I'm very happy to uh, share with you my research on urban heat at NUS. Yeah, sorry, can can we show my slides? Yeah. Maybe we start with him first and then you come. Oh, okay. Let's yeah. do it this way. So, okay, so now we go to Professor Jan Carmedier. Um, the floor is yours. Kindly share the screen. We will switch. Okay. Okay, do you see my screen? Hello? We are waiting. We see currently your face, so we are waiting to see your screen. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Not yet. Should be there. I will share it again. Do you see it now? No, we still see your face. <laughs> now it's coming. Now it's good. Go ahead. Okay. Perfect. So I will uh, shortly present uh, 
work that we did about urban heat islands and the relation to urban climate, densification and vegetation. Uh, so I will talk mainly about this uh, relation in this triangle. Uh, let me uh, give as an example uh, Zurich, which is situated in Switzerland. And I will uh, present to you as an example how we have this relation between climate, densification, and vegetation. So uh, Zurich is a city that also experiences heat waves. And you see here an example of a heat wave. We define a heat wave as a period where for three days we have temperatures, air temperatures above 30 degrees. And you see here uh, the heat wave. In red, this is the air temperature at the city, above 35 degrees it goes. We have also in blue, Kloten, which is the airport, which is a rural area. And you have the difference in black here at the bottom, where you see um, the, the urban heat island effect. So you see the difference, so which is the zone in red above. Now, as you, uh, uh, we, we can simulate this at a larger scale. So this is a mesoscale simulation of a heat wave day uh, during uh, uh, a heat wave in Zurich. And you see that the local temperatures at 4 p.m. in the afternoon go above 40 degrees. Um, we studied during the last 20 years what, uh, how many heat waves we have. We could count 30 heat waves and you see here all the pictures of the different heat waves, they have different lengths, different intensities. Uh, but so we have more than uh, 30 of, over this period. And if you take now the uh, monthly maximum urban heat island intensity, so it's the difference between the temperature in the city and the rural environment, you see that we uh, had in, uh, in the beginning in 1991, we had a, a heat wave, urban heat island intensity of around six, and that increased to more than seven to seven, 7.2 over time. You, of course, see a big scatter. This is normal for weather uh, conditions. And you, you see that we have a, an increase over 10 years of 0 0.4 degrees on average, which is quite a lot. We also counted the, the average number of heat days per month during the summer. And you see that we had an increase from three to seven over 30 years. So this is much more than a doubling over 30 years. So that means that due to the climate change, we have really an increase of number of heat waves. And that of course has an effect on the urban heat island effect. Um, we also see in Zurich a densification. You see that it is a city uh, situated at, at the lake here. Uh, so here is the city, but it is also, uh, you have a lot of densifications in the neighboring uh, valleys. And you see here the plan or what is estimated to be the densification until 2040. Um, now, if we did also some um, uh, measurements or uh, these are satellite measurements and we looked at the temperatures uh, during the day, the surface temperatures, and you clearly see the lake, you see all the mountains, hills that are surrounding Zurich. And you clearly see also a big link between the, the surface temperatures and the densification. So it really shows that where you have much more buildings and a more densified city, that there also the surface temperatures are higher. A study we did was to see what is the link between this densification and the higher temperatures and the uh, building cooling demand. And, uh, a method to characterize that is the cooling degree hours. So what we do here is we look at the outside temperature and we integrate uh, all the temperatures for every hour, which are above 22 degrees Celsius. This is a set point temp temperature that we, we have chosen. Uh, so we, we look at this uh, red zone. So this is what is a measure for how much we have to cool. And so if you do this for the summer months, June and July for uh, Zurich, you clearly see that you have the highest cooling demands in the city center here, where you have a lot of densification and also in neighboring villages and cities, you have uh, this um, uh, higher building cooling demands, which is totally related also to densification. 
And if we now look at uh, over 30 years, what is the uh, building cooling demand, we see that uh, for the rural environment, we have a, an increase uh, of about 50% over 30 years. But in the city center, we see that it is more than doubled. So you clearly see that the, the urban heat island effect has a very strong link to the increase in building cooling demand. So it is clear that urbanization densification leads to an increase of the urban heat island effect. Now to look at what is the impact of vegetation and water, I'm sorry, I, we did not do this study for Zurich yet. We are doing this at the moment. We already did this study for Montreal. And so you see Montreal is a city consisting of uh, several islands in the river, uh, St. Lawrence River. And you see here the land use at the right. Uh, so you have the urban, the river is in red and uh, you see the different uh, land uses. And we did a calculation over uh, three months or four months, four summer months. And you clearly see here, for instance, an image at 5 e.m. Uh, these are the nighttime air temperatures. And you clearly see here the heat island effect. You clearly see also the river uh, and uh, the city. And so the main heat island effect is somewhere situated here. Um, what we then did is a little bit of a crazy idea, but we said, let's now imagine that the city is built totally with city. So we replace the river by uh, city and we calculated the difference in nighttime air temperature. And what you see here is that the city, that the river now, the temperature here increases with four degrees. So because we made, we made extra city, the urban tissue, you have heating up, and then you see that by convective winds from this part here, you get also heating up of the city with two degrees. Uh, the other idea is we replace the river here by vegetation, which is here in yellow, and we also calculate the difference in air temperatures during the night. And you see that now we have an extra cooling from going from water to vegetation of four degrees. And again, this has an impact on the city of uh, two degrees. So we have a cooling, just replacing water by vegetation, we have a cooling of the city of two degrees. And uh, you see here, we calculated then the, uh, the, the urban heat islands, the size of it. So this is when we have uh, no river, we have totally urban tissue. That is when we have a river, you see that now there is a shrinkage of the urban heat island. And when we have vegetation, you see clearly that the urban heat island effect is decreasing. But you also see that part of the city, you cannot mitigate by that. So because the, of course, the vegetation is too far away from this part, you don't mitigate here uh, the, the temperatures. Again, we can calculate the building cooling demand. And I think it is very obvious that from a going a very densified city to adding more water or adding vegetation, you really see a decrease in building cooling demand. So that really shows that measures like water and vegetation are working to decrease uh, building uh, cooling demand. So that means that we can mitigate uh, for partly by vegetation and water the urban heat effect. However, I think if you have seen the numbers, we are only limited to something like two degrees uh, decrease. And we see that with climate change, that the increase of the urban heat island effect and the increase in cooling demand is going much faster. So that means that it is difficult to counteract the increase in cooling demand and urban heat island effect. So what are some ideas that we have in uh, uh, mitigating that is that we think that just with passive cooling technologies for residential buildings, that this will be not sufficient. So we think that also in Switzerland and probably also in Singapore and other cities, we have to switch to really cooling. We have to cool uh, our buildings actively, but not using uh, CO2, uh, technologies with a lot of CO2 foot, uh, footprint, but for instance, free cooling technology. So we use here evaporation or infrared radiation to the sky to cool, and we can, can combine it with technologies like uh, heat pumps and ice storage. Uh, another idea is that we really have to look at 
trying to maximize the urban cooling by urban ventilation and vegetation. And we should, of course, also make that our buildings are uh, very uh, good performing with respect to energy performance. And finally, another idea is that we should again switch our idea of just having outdoor and indoor spaces and also try to use semi outdoor spaces where we have uh, an improved uh, climate where people can stay uh, and are not exposed to the total heat of the urban heat island. And in that, I'm really advocating to have microclimate diversity. And I just give you here an example, a study we did in Zurich, uh, where we looked at the densification of the city, uh, but we said, okay, let's make uh, gaps between the buildings so that we can have ventilation and let's integrate also some trees. And then you can see that you can really create some different climates I will not go into detail and explain everything, but just show you one example here of a courtyard that here is just densified. Here we is densified with gaps. And here we have also some uh, trees in the surrounding uh, streets. And by that you see, clearly see that you can create here inside uh, a space where people probably will uh, like to uh, stay outside. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, I'm willing to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carmelier. I will take your questions very soon. I would like at this stage to remind also the online participants, please write questions. We will be able to pick them up later. So now we go to Professor Yuan and to his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Yeah. So very happy I can have this opportunity to show our research on, on urban uh, heat. So I start my uh, presentation from the factors that cause the urban heat risk. And uh, we downscale the global climate modeling results into the local impact in Singapore. And uh, we do the projections. And we look at the air temperature at the Pulau Bin because there's no urbanization. So we'll be only affected by the climate change. The blue line is the historical data at the Pulau Bin, and the red line is the, our projection result. The result indicates that air temperature could increase about 0.4 to 0.6 degrees in 2030, which is not very far away. And uh, could be the air temperature increment could be 1.2 to 1.6 degrees in 2050. And we used RCP 8.5 as the worst case scenarios to prepare Singapore to do the projection. And the second factor is the urbanization, as Wenton and uh, Prof. Young Hamlet mentioned. That we noticed that air temperature increment at different districts with different urbanizations, with different development, actually is very different. And the, the maximum air temperature increment could be 0 0.8 degrees, which is very significant to thermal comfort, to energy consumption, to public health. So that's the reason why we need the urban transformation. And this slide shows the concept of the climate resilience. There's the gap between the supply and demand. And the, very obviously, we need to narrow down this gap and we need to bridge this gap by applying both uh, passive and active strategies. And urban planning, urban design actually is a kind of the long-term uh, passive strategies. Long-term means that we cannot see the benefit from the sustainable urban planning very soon. And uh, if we make any mistake at the urban planning, the, the consequence actually is also very long-term and we cannot easily correct the mistake. So that's the reason why we need to provide a very solid and a very informative um, understandings and planning strategies to support the urban planning. This is also the motivation to us to conduct the, the research on urban climate. So we work on four things, um, climate uncertainty, uh, realistic urban climate modeling and uh, outdoor sensing and uh, climate sensitive design and planning. The fourth one is the most important one because only the fourth one is the real actions will cause the real impact. Um, regarding the climate uncertainty, we are now trying to narrow down the uncertainty and try to downscale the uncertainty to the district scale. District scale is very important. And uh, we apply both uh, machine learning and the mesoscale numerical modelings to narrow down and to downscale the uncertainty. 
Regarding the climate modeling we are looking at the urban heat island, the point here is that now for urban climate resilience, the average scenario is not enough. We need to look at the extreme scenarios. So this is the animation and what you can see from this animation now is the normal situations with the annually average wind speed. And the red stuff is not the fire, it's the heat, the heat distributions. You may already notice that when the wind speed decreased, the heat transfer is totally different and distribution is totally different. And this is so-called extreme scenarios. As you can see there's no incoming wind and the UHI is very intensive and you can see the very obvious and very big uh, urban heat bloom. So that to improve the urban climate resilience, we have to look at this kind of extreme scenarios and get information from there to prepare ourselves. Um, another topic is the uh, urban heat, uh, urban and opportunity heat, which is from the split unit, the air conditioners at the residential buildings. Um, again, at the normal situation, the impact is not significant. The air temperature increment is very little. But at the extreme scenarios, with the very low wind speed, the air temperature could be increased by the Anthropogenic heat only from the AC by two degrees. Two degrees is very significant to the energy consumptions. Um, we push our model a little bit more so that we can see the hourly variance of the impact of the Anthropogenic heat uh, on the air temperature. So this is the midnight, so the worst scenarios, okay? Because everybody is at home and they're using the AC at that moment. Um, the third thing is the climate sensing. Climate sensing is very important because we need to validate our models and we need to uh, get better understandings on the, on the microclimate in the real world. And I would like to emphasize that actually uh, we are not only looking at the, the microclimate itself, we are not measuring the microclimate itself, we are also looking at the impact of the planning and designs on microclimate. So we set up 12 weather stations at the downtown areas, at the three uh, HDB areas. These three HDB areas share the same urban context and share the same microclimate at district levels. But if we look at the microclimate at the neighborhood scale, they are totally different. The difference is caused by the different design, different building topologies. Okay, so this is the four things, the climate sensitive designs. So actually I present this slide several times. And at the left hand side is the map done by the meteorologist, which is the rainfall. And the right hand side is the master planning done by the urban planners. Both of them are working on the map and the, the climate information is supposed to support the urban planning. But actually you can see the map they are working on are very different and the working ways are also very different. So there's the gap and we need to narrow down this gap. And to narrow down this gap, actually the interpretation is very important. And I want to use this example to illustrate why the interpretation is very important. This CFD simulation is done by myself several years ago. And uh, this, is, this is a quite nice result and show the wind speed and the wind factors very clearly in very high resolutions. But urban planner maybe ask me, okay, so then so what? Actually this result did not provide enough information to them to move forward, to make decisions. So what should be the building topologies? What should be the land use? What should be the density? So that the urban climate analytics should not just stop at here. And the semi the CFD simulation result. And we do the interpretations. In the interpretations, we look at two things. One thing is the impact of building our design, the existing buildings, our designs, on the airflows, which is actually the potential air pass, the Y arrows you can see at the street maps with three uh, different input interactions. And the second thing we are looking at actually is more important is the impact of the wind speed on the thermal comfort. So we classify the wind speed, we classify this map based on the impact of the wind speed on thermal comfort. Okay, so with these two interpretations, we can tell the architect, we can tell the urban planners where the wind speed is okay to the thermal comfort and where it's not. And we can tell them how to improve 
the building topology, uh, sorry, the, the building design and urban planning, okay, to improve the thermal comfort. So we combine these three maps together and we get this one. I call this one as the uh, wind potential map and we classify the whole site into four classes. And the based on the assessment, we develop the corresponding mitigation strategies and design strategies. Um, so for example, at the class A, the blue areas, uh, the area with the, the best natural ventilation potentials, um, we suggest the architect to put the high-rise buildings over there, the residential buildings, so that when the, residen the, the residents want to enjoy the natural ventilation, open the window, they can enjoy the fresh and cold air, but not the, the unsupportive heat. At the gray areas, actually, is the, the area uh, with very bad natural ventilation means that no matter which day, uh, no matter where the incoming wind comes, comes from, there's no natural ventilation. No matter how the architect designed the buildings, over there, there's no natural ventilation. So we don't suggest the architect put any uh, outdoor activities over there. So this is how we transfer the numerical simulation result into the planning strategies, the real actions, and the real impact by using the interpretations. Um, this is the, another design. Uh, this is not the real project. This is the design competition. We're trying to find an uh, alternative to uh, reclaim the, the land from the, the sea areas. And so to avoid to uh, totally remove the marine creatures, but at the same time, we still can have the high density community. And we apply a lot of um, climate sensitive design strategies and the climate understandings in these designs. So at the district levels, um, we look at the whole site, the permeability to make sure the air can go through. And we zoom in to the building scales. We look, we take care of the, the building topologies and uh, increase the building porosities. And uh, based on this assessment, we provide the, the different active strategies and put the act, active strategies at the right place to make the strategies more efficient and uh, make them work in the real life. And so this is the rendering and in the design competition, we won the first prize. So this is how we connect the, the people uh, with the nature and the conserve and cultivate together. Um, yeah, so this is another rendering. So the, the, the kids after dinner can enjoy the low tide, and can, can have fun. Yeah, so this is what I have for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuan. Now we come to the, to the discussion part of this session. And I would like to invite all of you in this hall to raise your hands if you have any questions to the three panelists. Um, please come forward. Yes, we have a question. Can someone bring her the mic? Yeah, you can hear me. <laughs> Maybe I'll just count, but I, I was wondering, ah, perfect. I was wondering about the interrelationship between um, the architectural strategies and transport choices. So um, you have in the, uh, in the last presentation, we saw the Kabul viaduct running across the, the, the top of, of the map that you showed. Um, in, in the other cases, you're also looking at transport links and how, um, but you didn't discuss them specifically. So I was wondering whether transport choices um, are a big part then of the, uh, the urban heat island effect and then possible solutions to it. Um, the question would go to anyone. Um, maybe let Mr. Chu, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I basically, I think in my, one of my slides, I talked about uh, planning for uh, mobility. Okay. So planning for mobility, uh, urban heat is one of the considerations. I, I would say it's not the primary considerations. So uh, I talked about different tiers. One is to reduce transport demand. 
So uh, reducing transport demands basically means trying to, to locate amenities and jobs, etc., closer to homes, so you don't need to travel at all. And the, the driver for that is fundamentally convenience for the people. So, so the savings to them is time. But by reducing the transport need, you reduce the trip, and hence the carbon and better in the trip, and hence any of the urban heat associated with that. The next level for us, we are trying to promote uh, what we call a car-like society, and we encourage the strong use of public transport. Because public transport, uh, you know, in terms of density of moving of people, you, you can move thousands of people on the uh, MRT or the trains, uh, large numbers of people on the bus, but when you have uh, private vehicles, the efficiency is very low. And hence, I mean, if you are driving, basically you're moving a, a few tons of metal just to move a few kg of humans. <laughs> So, so the, the efficiency is very low, and hence uh, there's a lot of wastage of energy, a lot of wastage of land. Uh, you know, the road space that you need is, is compared to uh, having buses is, is, is much bigger than compared to having a lot of private vehicles. And then the, the last strategy for us is to, to try to have greener vehicles. So uh, when we, we uh, Singapore government, we announced our plans to, to move to uh, uh, EVs, uh, uh, since uh, 2019, we, we make some major announcements and this year we enhance uh, some of the, the plans and um, have a more aggressive plans. Uh, basically, we will be switching to entirely EVs. So the, the move from EVs to from internal combustion engines, the, from the heat point of view, basically every small combustion engine, you generate heat. Yeah. So, so by moving to EVs, you, you actually remove uh, that heat. There's other environment benefits of uh, uh, air pollution and uh, noise pollution, but uh, basically we find that from a carbon point of view, um, EVs are about twice as efficient compared to um, uh, internal combustion engines. Uh. Yeah. So, so there is a huge uh, carbon savings. Uh, it also help, happens to be good for the consumer because when you pump electricity versus you pump petrol, in Singapore's context, electricity uh, per km, electricity is half the cost compared to petrol. So, so there is a benefit for if you drive a lot. Lah. Yeah. Thank you. May I ask my other colleagues in the panel, do you want to follow up on this? Um, if that's not the case, I want to ask another question over there. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. We talked a lot about temperature today, but in Singapore and I think the countries around Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, humidity is a huge factor. Um, and so my question is not just how much of a factor is it, what are the projection of the increase or decrease in humidity, but also how does that affect design elements in building where you place the cities, the three increase reduce humidity you, you presented uh, a potential city underwater does that increase humidity or not have you looked at those different aspects and then uh, maybe to our uh, friend in Europe I mean uh, is humidity a factor in cities like Zurich as well or in Europe then you only look at uh, temperature thank you very much thank you very much maybe Jan do you want to go first yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, uh, humidity is very important from a point of view of thermal comfort. So, uh, as you know, our body, we have to release heat and one of the mechanisms is uh, transpiration. And so if the relative humidity outside is too high, we lose this potential of uh, transpiration. So, indeed, uh, if you want to look at mitigation measures, you have not only to look at air temperature, you have to look at surface temperatures because the radiation from the surfaces to your body is very important. And you have to look at uh, wind velocity because higher winds uh, increase the thermal comfort and then relative humidity. Now, uh, there's a big difference, of course, between Europe and uh, Southern Asia. Southwest Asia is because, of course, we are in Zurich, we have uh, low relative humidities. And in that sense, uh, trees uh, that uh, provide shade uh, have a cooling effect due to transpiration, but also increase the relative humidity because they transpire. 
um, uh, they work very good. So this I call trees uh, uh, very intelligent shading devices that cool themselves. Now, if you go to uh, um, other cities, hot, humid climates, then of course trees provide still shade and so can increase uh, uh, the thermal comfort, but also increase the relative humidity. And so they counteract, this counteracts a little bit. And so it does not mean that you can just fill, fill up your city uh, with trees somewhere like there is an optimum. And so uh, some people studied for different cities the optimum of uh, greenery. And if I remember well, for Singapore, it's around 50% of, uh, of the surface. And then somewhere uh, you have again a decrease in, in thermal comfort. So for sure, there is an optimum. And if you have uh, humid climates, then the effect of trees is relatively much less uh, a solution than, than in cities which are, have a dry, a dry climate. Very much. Do you want to follow up? Yeah, maybe I add up one short point. Yeah, so actually it's very challenging at the tropical areas to, to deal with the humidity. And the humidity is very important to the thermal comfort. So because everywhere is wet, yeah, so it's very challenging to decrease the relative humidity, but there's the daily variations. At the noon times, the relative humidity is uh, lower at the night and it will be higher. So what we can do is that uh, we promote the natural ventilation. So the airflow can remove the, the humidity, the, the wet stuff at the areas which is very close to your skin. So the people will feel more comfortable. Yeah, yeah so we open the space, promote the natural ventilation to increase the, the thermal comfort. Thank you. Are there more questions in this hall? Okay, then let me take another question. We just talked about vegetation and the importance of greenery. Mr. Chu, um, for the case of Singapore, perhaps, how important is natural capital in mitigating against urban heat in the future? Okay, I think we, we talked a, a fair bit about this uh, and also the impacts of uh, greenery on humidities. Uh, we find greenery and uh, natural capital is, uh, is a, a tremendous positive factor in uh, helping us to manage the ambient air temperature and thermal comfort. So greenery provides uh, shade. I think we find that shade is one of the uh, biggest uh, factor in terms of uh, uh, lowering our uh, uh, urban heat island effects and uh, in, uh, boosting thermal comfort. It reduces the, the solar heat gains and also, um, I think our research shown that trees can reduce uh, the ambient air temperature about 0.6 degrees at midday. Yeah, so, so, and the reduction at uh, up to 3 degrees uh, just above the surface. So, so it has a, a big impact. And beyond thermal comfort, we also find that the greenery has other beneficial uh, uh, from uh, ecological services, uh, providing uh, cleaner water, helping us to keep uh, fresh air, and of course, uh, improve uh, health and uh, wellness. Um, I think we did a, a lifestyle preference survey this, uh, this year, and about two-thirds of the public feel that uh, greenery improved their well-being. Uh, it's important for their well-being. So it also acts as an area for recreation and social functions, etc. So, so overall, we find that greenery has uh, a strong uh, positive impact on urban heat, but we also uh, find that greenery has many other planning benefits. So, so as I said, as planners, we are trying to optimize multiple objectives. Urban heat is only one, 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 one facet of it, and uh, many of our measures that we look at will have to fulfill multiple benefits. Thank you very much. I would like to add another question related to this, and we just touched on the lifestyle part, and I want to ask a question to all my panelists. Um, should we look for new sustainable cooling technologies or should we adapt lifestyle? Um, Professor Carmelier, you mentioned about well-being and so on. Can you maybe elaborate on this? Yeah, so I, I think we, we uh, when I was also educated and uh, we, we, we got courses about thermal comfort and thermal comfort was... Uh, uh, um, inspired totally by uh, uh, indoor uh, climate. 
And so uh, it was said that the indoor climate had to be between ranges and so on and so on. And it was very strictly educated how we had to uh, maintain our indoor climate in between those uh, in this comfort band. Now, I think uh, this is something that we probably have to change. I, I think that this very strict comfort and the cooling, like for instance, in, in US, you have really the cooling of your buildings to uh, 18, 19 degrees, that this is something we should not uh, keep being so strict on it. And I am I already explained a little bit, I am advocating this um, uh, microclimate diversity. So it means that not every space in your building should be at the same comfort level. There should be some places where you work and you, you won't have it very good, that are where you are sleeping, that is very good comfort. But there could be some transition zones where you have a different climate. So it's in between open and, and uh, indoor space. So I think we have somewhere to revise our requirements of what is, uh, what is thermal comfort. And I think a lot of people can adapt and we see that also that a lot of people adapt uh, to the climate and can adapt to the climate. And so we have to provide spaces, not everywhere, not everywhere indoor, not everywhere outdoor, but we have to provide spaces where it's comfortable and where, where people like to be. And going back to mobility, maybe not for Singapore, but for a lot of other cities, we are thinking also that um, if, if you, you can travel by walking through through your city, of course, in small distances, this is very important. So people really like to go from one building to the other building during noon, to go to eat somewhere, to go to a restaurant. All this walking around has a, uh, is very important for well-being. So we, I think we have to go away from the strict thermal comfort. Uh, to more uh, well-being. I think it was already indicated that also vegetation is not only, you have not only to look at heat islands for vegetation, but also people, uh, it is known that people really uh, have a much better well-being uh, in an environment which uh, shows micro uh, climate diversity. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Yuan, you want to add on this? Mm, no, yeah. I, I would say it's a, it's a bit of a, I think, I think the question is a bit like, uh, misleading like, because I, the obvious answer is you have to do both. Okay. So you, you, the, the only I, I think I would add to this is, is that some of the action that we have to do is a collective action. So the government or the organizations or the building owners have to, have to implement some of the sustainable technology, whether it's solar or, or things like that. But there's also a lot of room for individual action. So, so the, for example, the, the hotel building owners can set the temperature one degree higher. So, so that affects all of us. But individually, we can do that when we are at home. If, you, if we set all our uh, aircon temperatures higher by one degree, you know, it, um, if all households do that, uh, I think the carbon savings is equivalent to taking 7,000 cars off the road for a year. So we, we did some, some modeling. So, so all of us have a role to play. I think having good technology will help us get there faster. But even then, there is a choice of uh, individual decision to switch. We talked about mobility earlier. We talked about EVs. So, so even with uh, government support, you know, uh, making sure there are a lot of charging stations and having some incentives, there's still an individual decision to buy the EV. Yeah. So, so and then of course, uh, our position is other than having uh, EVs. Actually, the the easier solution is to drive less. You know? Yeah, so, so some of it, you, you do it at a collective decision, but some of it, you have to do individual decisions, but both are important in order for us to, to really uh, mat, uh, manage urban heat and also help uh, to mitigate the climate change. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I just follow up uh, when Tom mentioned the, the individual decisions. So actually, the individuals are very different with the planners and designers and the government. So, um, but they are still the decision makers. Yeah, they can decide, okay, so when and they want to turn on and turn off the AC. AC is the very good things to Singapore. AC is not the evil. AC is very necessary. But the people should um, only use the AC when and where it's necessary. And I think this is the right way and this is more important than the, the new technologies maybe. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I would like to wrap up this session in, in light of the time. Um, I think we are in an era where urbanization, densification is a real issue. We are also in a change of uh, mobility. We know how important it is to have spaces for people to move. And I think especially in the Asian region with many mega cities um, coming up and more and more um, heat being developed in these uh, urban centers, I think we know how important it is. And of course, climate change will add uh, to this pattern. So I think urban heat risk is a real challenge for planners, for individuals, but also for decision makers. And I think we will have to look very closely in our efforts to make cities livable, um, sustainable, and also create the well-being we need to look uh, on all these topics. So I would like to thank very much the three panelists, Professor Carmelier, who joined us from Montreal in Canada, then Professor Yuan, and also Mr. Chu. Thank you very much. And this is the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs>